Awesome. Thank you. Um, I, uh, thank you for coming. And uh, this is like the solving wicked problems uh, for a session this morning. Um, <clears throat> so maybe just uh, I think you've I've seen some of the speakers this morning already. So we have Paul Bennett, uh, Chief Creative Officer and part of IDEO. Um, Richard Buchanan, who's a professor and of design innovation at Case Western Reserve University, and also Tong Chi, right, in Shanghai. And he was my professor 20-something years ago. You know my age now. <laughs> and then next to me, we have uh, Dr. Dirk, um, and it's the, he's a deputy director of medical innovation and care transformation and KK Women's and Children's Hospital Singapore. Right, and my name is Elaine. Um, I represent uh, IXDA Hong Kong, uh, Interaction Designers Association of Hong Kong, and my own company is called Kaiser Innovation. So, uh, I just like to start the forum by maybe we'll just go round robin. Uh, maybe Paul, uh, Richard, and Dirk, you can talk a little bit about your background, how it uh, relates to design thinking. Paul, you've talked quite a bit this morning, but maybe you want to add something. Um, okay. Uh, so I and I, and then the reason why I'm telling this story is because it's going to come up in a second. I've been at IDEA for 18 years. Um, I've worked on over a thousand projects. Um, I'm 55 years old, and about a year ago, I found the project that I've been waiting 30 years to do. So I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the idea that sometimes, cosmically, you hit an idea at a certain point in your life where you're meant to find that problem, and that problem is meant to find you, and all of your skills kind of in that problem. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Yeah, so we've asked the speakers to each give a short video or a few slides just to give context of what they have done before related to design thinking, especially in the public sector, uh, you know, for society. And for you guys, um, behind your tag, there's a QR code. You can scan it so you can ask questions, right? Um, and, and then we'll pick, you know, the highest rating, highest rated questions afterwards. Okay. Do you want to? Am I on? Um, sorry, I'm covering crumbs. I'm going to stand because I can't sit. Yeah, it's like being in the bus station. It's weird. Um, hi. Is this the thing? Okay. Um, where to start? Uh, we live in really weird times, right? Like everything is in turmoil. I'm actually firmly of the belief that from revolution comes renaissance, that we're in sort of revolutionary times and everything is sort of going crazy. Um, and it's up to us as creative people to find opportunity in that and to, and to find hope. Uh, so I want to tell you a story about myself in this. Um, I met this guy about a year and a half ago. And the reason why I said 55 is because it's something interesting. Is when I met MG, this guy here, he said to me, how old are you? And I said, why? And he said, I think we're probably the same age. Tell me your age. And I said at the time, I'm 54. He went, me too. And I sat in this guy's room and I thought, God, I'm meant to meet this guy. You know how sometimes you meet somebody and you go, I'm meant to meet this person, right? So I was meant to meet this person. Um, he's got sort of the best job title of all time. He is the minister of the future. <laughs> so His Highness Sheikh Mohammed has a great, uh, Dubai is an amazing place. Um, and, and MG, Mohammed al Qadawi is the minister of the future. He runs the cabinet. Um, and his, and he was, essentially he's the Prime Minister, but he doesn't want to be the Prime Minister because Prime indicates more than. He wants to be the future. So he's very interested in the future. And he said to me, what do you think about radicalism right now? He said this. So obviously Dubai is in a strange place. He said, we live in a tough neighborhood. Radicalism and extremism are, in, extremism are on our doorstep. We need to counteract this radicalism with radical new forms of creativity. I mean, I've waited 30 years for somebody to ask me, like, do you want to be part of doing something about that? Right, that's like the ultimate designer's challenge. And so, and I sort of alluded to this before, but you don't come back with that, you don't come back with something like that with like a framework and a proposal and a PDF, right? That, that's completely lame. Um, so I wrote in this kid's book um, about two trees, and it was the story of the palm, a symbol of life and hope in the harshest of places. And the redwood idea comes from California. The California redwood is a symbol of rootedness and interdependence. And so together, we have now created a design entity inside of government called Palmwood, where the palm tree meets the redwood. Um, and so what is it? It's a joint venture between us and the UAE government. A design-led movement creating involved new solutions for governments and organizations, 
developing creative capabilities in the people of the UAE and opening up new conversations about what is possible through design. So I thought I would just cycle quickly through some of the stuff we've done. I shared this video before, I think I just have the first second of it again. There's a dark hole <coughs> growing inside society's heart. A destructive force that dishonors all we've built in the past and anything we might build in the future. Yet all of us have a choice. A chance to work together towards a society that's creative and optimistic. Palmwood brings together our different cultures to design solutions with governments, organizations, and communities that create positive impact across our society. We believe in the power of the palm, not the fist. Right, so this is us launching it. Uh, we did a big thing on stage, and it was, again, this sort of idea of not working for government, that whole vendor thing makes me nuts. Uh, so being partners with people in government and seeing ourselves as equal, co-creating projects, which is what we've done. Um, and so we've done 12 projects over the last, actually 12 now, that span, so this is some of the things we've done. Um, how do we empower creative leadership in the next generation? So we were talking before, like where do you start? The first place we started was with children. Um, and by asking children what their dreams were for the future, we were absolutely blown away by the quality of ideas, by the quality of empathy. One kid said to me, one of the briefs this little girl here actually created was, imagine a world where countries no longer exist. <laughs> Boom, right? Like that's the thing we all want to be doing. So kids and their creativity was our sort of starting place. Um, we built a space, which we, we worked with an architectural firm called uh, Big, and we built a space for radical collaboration called Area 2071 that is the government's new innovation hub um, that has this whole sort of energy, kinetic energy, bringing together private sector, public sector, and creativity. So this is now built. We have an office in there. It's fantastic. Um, again, as somebody who's just turned 55 and is, this is kind of rapidly coming towards me, we're very, very interested in the older population and unlocking the vitality of older people. Um, so very, very important to understand how, you, how older people and their ideas can be filtered into society. This is just a very interesting side note here. We brought in a bunch of people who are in their 60s and 70s and we were told by the government, oh, they're only going to last for like an hour and then they're going to want to go, you know, just after lunch. About seven and a half hours later, we had to literally throw these people out of the building because we couldn't stop them from talking. <laughs> this old dude here broke into poems and they were singing and there was all kinds of stuff. It was amazing. So again, you know, just the idea of unleashing the creative capacity of older people. This is a space that we're currently building for them. This is law that has been passed here. So again, I was talking about policy before. I had no idea what a policy was. I now write policies. They've now launched seven policies based on our work, the policies around older people, which is fantastic that we influence that. Understanding what well-being means in the Emirates. Everybody talks about Huga in Denmark and Ikigai in Japan. What is it in the Emirates? What does it mean to be well there, etc.? And that project we just finished in December, there's a high obesity crisis there. Junk food is on the rise, as you would imagine. So we launched a creative project helping kids eat healthily. So again, just a very quick video here that shows some of the stuff that we did. Watching children create, and this lady that's in the video, I'm just going to end this right here, this lady that's in the video is a minister. So getting a government, government minister, that's her there, she's the minister of food, getting her into the school to talk to kids, to actually hear their ideas firsthand was transformative. We just did a, we just did a launch of this uh, movement for them um, in the Emirates. So. Um, so that's it. So essentially now we're a year in, 12 projects. Um, we've got another, I think, six or eight projects on the, on the table. We're co-creating all the projects together. We're getting deeper and deeper into topics that are darker. So rather than just dealing with happy things, we're looking at things like social isolation. We're looking at equality. We're looking at gender. We're looking at all of these topics that were quite taboo. Interesting, and maybe I'll leave this as one last thought. The most interesting part for me in all of this has been an outsider given permission to actually talk about the things that are going on inside the culture and not see those as confrontational, but to see that as somebody who comes, to want to, who comes wanting to help. So we're not seen by saying, hey, what about loneliness? We're not seeing as undermining the fact that they have a culture that's predominantly happy. We're seeing as helping them build a happier culture. So that's my bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, good morning. My name is Dick Buchanan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Oh, I'm going to need this. Okay. It's a pleasure to be back in Hong Kong. I spent a lot of time here in the past. If you 
15 years ago and sooner. I spent a lot of time now in Shanghai. I introduced the first interaction design programs in the United States, and this is one of our, our students. I'm louder? Yes. Okay. How was that? A long time ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> long time ago. And in any case, uh, I've worked on large scale projects in system design, redesigning the Australian taxation system. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I know. And other things. But I, I, I thought today was the time to not talk about the big things because they seem almost inaccessible. As much as I respect what you do, Paul, this is very tough for us to get our imagination around, particularly here in Hong Kong. So I'm going to focus on something very micro and narrow, but to illustrate what a wicked problem is. So let's uh, begin this. Um, I want to explain where I think, am I going the right direction? I'm not. There we go. I want to explain briefly where I think Hong Kong is today. I need to put this in context because I thought the ABCD model was pretty interesting. Uh, I deal with what I call the four orders of design. First and second orders dealing with posters and toasters, communications, graphic design, and the industrial design. And I think Hong Kong has great success in that, in that development. You all know the work that's been done. Also in the interiors design. Surprisingly enough, that's been a great accomplishment. But I want to point out that we're moving toward what I call third and fourth order problems in society. Those are problems that are the domain of wicked problems. So matters of how we design services, processes, practices, and then how we design the bigger systems and platforms, organizations, and environments for how we live and work and play and learn. That's what concerns me a great deal. Uh, I want to characterize a wicked problem because I think that's what our session is really about. Uh, be careful about this. There are many features of wicked problems. Complexity is not one of them. It may happen that the problems are complex, but the central feature that makes a wicked problem is that values are essentially contested. Wherever you have a situation where values run head into each other from quite different points of view, that's what we mean by a wicked problem. Now, there are some wicked problems in communication and industrial, yes, but fundamentally in interaction areas and in the larger environmental, cultural, and organizational matters, fundamental value differences. And it's the task of design to navigate those dis differences and come up with a productive result. So I say essential. There are a variety of features. Uh, there's no one best solution. There are a variety of points of view, lots of participation. There are probably 15 characteristics. But fundamentally, remember this, where you find values essentially conflicting. Design works there today to try to resolve those differences. Not removing the differences, but finding a way to agree to go forward. Okay. You want to roll this? I want to show you this, this short, uh, let's see. This is where you can find the video. I can tell you that later. But can we try putting that up now? Good. He's going to try to navigate. I'm going to show you a project on breast cancer done in Oslo. This is the best interaction design project in the world in 2015. I was head of the jury of about uh, six or eight of us. And after two or three hundred excellent applications, we found this to be the best. Can you roll this? So we're going to play this. Sound up. Vi ser at ventetiden når det gjelder akkurat den utredningen som har vært kjempelang. Det har vært tatt sju uker, det har tatt opp til tolv uker, og det er en periode hvor kvinnen går og venter på å få et svar, og går og lurer på ikke bare om hun har kreft, men også om vi i det hele tatt husker på henne, eller om noe har skjedd underveis. Når vi kom inn til OS, så var det klart at det var mange fagpersoner som var litt skeptiske til den prosessen vi foreslo, og egentlig litt skeptiske til at design kunne løse problemet. Designerne stilte veldig, veldig mange spørsmål, og veldig enkle spørsmål som for oss er helt basic. Men det gjorde at vi fikk fram veldig mange problemstillinger. Fordi vi er jo en hel gjeng av ulike fagfolk, og vi skjønner jo ikke helt at det er at vi ikke ser... She's very nice in saying this. The problem was much deeper, I can imagine. The task was to rethink organizations, challenge constraints, and find workarounds. What we really did was facilitate a patient-centric process. We did in-depth interviews, contextual inquiry, role-play, co-creation workshops, and scenario testing to involve both patients and employees throughout the process. Yeah, that's what it's about. 
pasienten måtte organisere seg rundt OS. Eh, løsningen i dag er at OS har organisert seg rundt pasienten. Eh, gangen i den fra den kommer til fastegen er at fastegen er veldig viktig å gjøre en klinisk undersøkelse. Så man skriver en god henvisning. Det har vi også jobbet veldig mye med. Vår kommunikasjon til fastlegen at henvisningene må være gode. Og det kommer frem av et forbedret internettside også mot fastlegen. Og, og det nye forløpet nå skal bli sånn at den sendes til et felles henvisningsmottak, som også er veldig viktig. Det er en vei inn, det har det ikke vært før. Hun får da med seg en henvisningskvittering fra fastlegen sin, slik at hun vet at uh, hun, hun er inne i systemet. Når du kommer til fastlegen nå, så vil pasientene få med seg et skriv med hvordan forløpet blir. Der står det at de vil bli ringt opp dagen etter, vi får timer raskt til utredning, og det vil også være telefonnummer som de kan ringe til hvis de har noen spørsmål før de hører mot oss. I henvisningsmottaket så skal det være en røntgenlege som daglig sitter og vurderer henvisningene, så pasienten kan få timer raskt. Og så, når henvisningen er vurdert, så ringer vi pasienten og sier at du har time. Og den timen skal også komme raskt. Så får pasienten da time til undersøkelse, og så møter hun til diagnostikk. Det er jo diagnostikk, eh, bildetakling, prøvetakling, helst alt sammen i løpet av en dag. Vi skapte en ny retain som optimerer den diagnostikprosess. This allows diagnosis to happen in just four days. Four days. This reduces patient waiting times by an average of 90% over previous waiting times. Could you imagine that? I was shocked when I contacted Dr. Østberg, my fast lady. And so I had a phone for two days later. I wanted to show this for two reasons. One, the wicked problems that we face are between, in this case, patients and professionals, the medical care group. You, were, you should be impressed that they were not more angry about the changes they had to make. Believe me, at the middle management level, there is considerable resistance to change. I think middle management is the biggest place of resistance for change and bringing design thinking forward. And I regard the professionals as those middle management experts. That's one reason I wanted to show the project. The second was the fundamental change of idea. Notice the change. Instead of the, hot, the patient being shaped by the hospital, the hospital shaped itself around the patient. That is a fundamental inversion through the design thinking process. That's the creative moment. I get very tired of hearing about the steps of the design <coughs> thinking process and so forth. There are so many companies that tell you what the steps are. I find that interesting. I teach that to my very youngest students. The truth is there is something else that happens in this process. It's where ideas are turned upside down and changed and made feasible and believable. And that's, I think, what this project demonstrates. I think you would agree with that, Paul, as well. That's what you do also is the magic. So I wanted to show you that, and it's so concrete that I hope you can see that you can bring this kind of project into your own daily working here in Hong Kong. I know that healthcare is a serious, serious issue in Hong Kong. I see heads nodding. Oh, yeah, you recognize that, too very large load on the system, how can it be reshaped? This is one of the ideas for moving us forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> In fact, um, the Hong Kong Design Center just uh, ran a uh, user experience hunt. So sent out uh, questions to the community and actually asking for pain points of what Hong Kong people felt uh, was the most important pain points. And actually healthcare was one of the top ones. Um, actually, before we move further, um, uh, with Dirk, uh, I just want to clarify what wicked problem means because if you just translate wicked into Chinese, it's like tang off, right? You know, <laughs> but that's not what it really means, right? Um, I think maybe a better translation could be la sao, what's that? Kick sao, what's that? In more Cantonese, it's like ok out, okay? <laughs> Um, meaning it's very, very, and so in, in, in uh, Richard's term, it's not really about complexity, right? It's about clash of values. Yes. Um, so in Cantonese, it's like, uh, 
okay? Whether it's uh, between top management, middle, bottom, or between different disciplines, like whether it's tech, design, you know, marketing, operations, right? So this is what we're talking about, okay? So I just want to clarify that. All right, so Dirk, you want your turn now? Thanks, I think I'm invited because I'm very wicked. <laughs> Apologies, my Cantonese is not that good, so I don't know which of the three versions it should be. Um, I guess I'm invited also because I'm from Singapore. As you can see, my, my face looks very Singaporean. <laughs> like the two other speakers that were before mentioning that they had something with Singapore. So I know it's always a bit sensitive to speak about Singapore in Hong Kong. So I, I will not do that, right? but just say that I'm from there. And yes, the government has taken some kind of centrally incentivized views to build a smart nation, almost as smart as Hong Kong, right? which really makes, makes sure that every part of society is involved in it. Right? And healthcare indeed is one of it. I'm glad my hospital there looks a little bit like low like our hospital actually. It, it is our hospital if you if you check on the smartnation.sg website. And I want just to use that as a background and, and really leave room for, for discussion because this is a forum and we should talk and not just have, have presentations. But that is the background that I'm coming from. So talking about top down, bottom up, yes, there is definitely a top down part that plays a role in allowing us healthcare professionals to, to do our job in designing as well. And I just want to make it very practical as, as Dick has shared uh, uh, as well. Uh, one, one, I don't know whether it's theoretically a wicked problem, but in healthcare it definitely is. And it is the simple thing of washing your hands before you touch a patient. You know we are supposed to do that, right? You know we kill patients when we do not do that. Especially in busy areas like, like Hong Kong or Singapore. Right. So that's the very basic thing. We know that for 200 years since Samuel Weiss demonstrated that. Still, the compliance in every hospital around the world is lower than it should be. Right. So the question is why? Right? Doctors do not work in hospital because they want to kill patients. <laughs> Nurses do not go to work in the morning and say, okay, today I'm going to touch someone and put my bacteria into her. Right? It's other things. It's in the midst of the flow where to give an example, I'm, I'm supposed to touch this lady, right? But I have a microphone and a pointer that usually works very well in my hand. If I'm going to do something, I need to make a decision. Will I put or give this to someone else? Go to find the infection control, the, uh, I don't know, the, the hand wash somewhere, wash my hands and come back? Or will I just practically go ahead because there are many patients waiting around me here? Right? That is the kind of decision that I need to make. And often we use education as a tool. We say, well, let's teach people how dirty their hands are. Right? Let's show it under some blue light and you will see actually it looks clean, but it's not that clean, right? You, you've basically seen some of those approaches lots of people using. Or we put a very nice poster on the wall, right? No pain, no gain. Please wash your hands. If you don't wash your hands, right, things might happen. You see that in hospital on lifts all the time. The signal that the poster is giving, of course, is correct. But the question is, if I'm not going to touch this lady, and that poster is on the wall there talking to me that I should wash hands, right? does it make sense? Can design help and get gurus like we have today, right? Help us doing that. I think to some extent, yes, they can, but we also can help ourselves by applying some of those concepts, right? Often you need multiple disciplines as shared in the morning, right? And to me, bringing those disciplines physically together in a hospital context is very important. Right? So don't leave it to the professors to teach. Don't leave it to sessions like today, but apply it in your own organization, wherever you are, from tomorrow onwards, to make sure that the guys are there. They know what your problem is, and they are able to share about what the problem and the pain points are, as well as the solutions. I fully agree on, on poor points. I hate the word vendors as well. Traditionally, a vendor and a hospital were two different parties, and the vendor is supposed to, to, to sell us something, like hand hygiene material, right? And we are on the receiving end. But if you want to create a problem for hand hygiene solution, we should think beyond that. And my little video is going to illustrate that. Can we have this video, please? No, the video back now. Click. <laughs> Technology might play a role, but right? 
So again, very basic, right? It's, it's about touching that moment that you are about to touch the patient and making sure that you are reminded at that time. And we started actually off with, with having a physical line. We did some other projects where we put physical line on the floors, like here I'm in the yellow space, right? Here I'm in the gray space, literally. How many of your operating rooms have floors like that, where you tease doctors by just showing the colors where there's a clean space and where's the dirty space, right? Because highly educated doctors are difficult to change, we all know that. But why can a line at the immigration control or at the post office help people to stand you know, while in the OT they might do different things? Right? Design can help. Again, it's a, a simple uh, uh, example, but I think often it, it, might, it might work. But of course that line is still very static. So I enjoyed Steve's presentation this morning as well, and I think that's absolutely where Asia, and in particular of course, mainland China is also coming in. Can we utilize some of those technologies to help us doing it in a smart way. Because that static line that you just saw in that video, and that just recently won some Asian hospital management award, right? that is still a very static line based on where patients are seated and whether they are still in that box. So can we go beyond that box, for example, using computer vision? Can we have this one as well on the background? Uh, I think we can. Even including uh, taking on uh, privacy rules, like using this Kinect, basically, right? which is just looking to the bodies, identifying who is who, and then notifying you know, whether you are supposed to touch without having washed. Because you can train your algorithm whether hands are washed or not. Right? And again, the hand hygiene problem might just look like a small one, but it is a big one. It costs life and it costs a lot of money. Because currently we are doing audits. All of us who are accredited are doing audits. We have our nurses doing audits instead of being a nurse. Right? Who is working in healthcare who ever wanted to be just the hand hygiene auditor? Right? None of us. So there's a lot of potential for technologies taking over this kind of things. So I think low and high tech, that line on the floor, as well as technology, can really help to do the standard stuff so that we humans can focus on high touch. Again, it was touched on this morning already. Where are the humans? I think it's the wrong question. You do not need to be afraid. It's the question, how are we applying it and how are we using it to enhance patient's care? And we need insights from other sectors. Yes, healthcare traditionally has been conservative. Right? But we need to make new combinations because healthcare has also been progressive in the sense that technology is not new. You know what, what we put around our neck right, to show that we are doctors. That simple, stupid stethoscope. A piece of technology. You just put a piece of technology around your shoulder and simply you are a doctor. Right? So yes, we are quite open to, to make new combinations. And do that with engineering is something I really enjoy. But the data should also be there to prove what we are doing. And I guess that's maybe something for debate as well, with you know, a professor as well as a, a design thinker, a guru. I firmly believe data is necessary. And yes, sometimes the design world is a bit soft pole. So please help us to make that combination and show the impact that we will need to show to others and convince them. Thank you. Right, thank you, Dirk. So now we know to ask our doctors to wash their hands before touching us, right? <laughs> okay. So uh, just by a raise of hands, I just want to get a feel of this room. How many of you are from public sector, the government? Okay. How about NGOs? Uh, corporate? Okay. Um, startups? Tech startups? Okay. Uh, designers? How many of you are designers, actually? Okay, great. So we have some context for the conversation. So, well, since uh, this is a forum, we actually want to dive right into the questions, right? Um, and uh, we just wanted to give some context for you because well, when we talk about design thinking, it could be so like up in the air, right? So, so now you get a sense of people's background uh, on, this, on the stage. Um, so what are the challenges and learnings like when you were doing these projects, especially in Asia, right? You know, like, uh, you know, because design thinking really kind of stemmed from maybe US or Europe. Um, so what are the challenges in learning when you're trying to apply this into the public sector and societal issues? Well, clearly there are cultural issues. It's very tough to think in a different way. We're used to, we're a word culture. We all use words. We talk, talk, talk. But I think using visualizations into being a very valuable tool for design thinking. I worry about the steps. We talked about that before, how to get past the steps. But for me, the biggest obstacle is still the middle management in organizations. I would say that we've made good progress in, at the C-suite, 
And I think workers also enjoy the work of design. But the middle managers are constrained terrifically by corporate policy and their job demands. And I think that's where the difficulty lies for us. That's the serious challenge now. Anything else is by the way. How many of you are middle managers here? <laughs> Nobody wants to raise their hands, right? How many? Okay. Just one, really? Okay. How many of you work with middle managers? <laughs> the whole room has to go up for that. Okay. So, any of you want to raise any questions? Yes? So, uh, uh, Richard, you talk about that, but not specifically in the evening context. So, your, your, your question uh, that you raised is, in, in the Asian context, do you find it different? So this yes, in area, fact, that's a great yeah. question. I do find it uh, not significantly different, to, to be honest about this. I know that when I work with CEOs on the mainland, um, they seem to understand design thinking well and are in favor of it. They're very enthusiastic. And when you talk with workers in ordinary, but the middle managers in Asia, as well as in, in uh, Western countries, they're the obstacle because the pressures are on them. I don't find a great difference in culture, but there is a cultural factor. Uh, there is pressure in other ways. The pressure is manifest in other ways in Asia. You know, you know guys, what I think, you should stop looking to the US and to other places as being the example. You know? I hated to talk about the necessity of diversity, but uh, here we have three white guys and one lady with a strong American accent. <laughs> <laughs> there is no need for that. The capacity is here. We talk about visualization. You are writing in characters for centuries, right? And you have a few stupid Westerners saying you should visualize. Right? Take some of the initiative yourself, right? And really believe that you can do it. I believe there's a strong potential for that, especially for smaller places like Hong Kong, right? And maybe here speaking my Dutch heart, we've been doing it like that as well, right? We are small and we kind of, yes, we look to the US to see for good ideas and of course we take a lot from them, right? But we also believe we can do it ourselves. And I think that mentality definitely gives a lot of hope. I, I came to Asia six years ago to really learn I spent time in the US before, but I thought Hong Kong and Singapore yes, were, were, were a bit more bustling, right? So I think there's definitely hope, and when you talk about optimism, yes, there is a lot of optimism here. Utilize that, you know, start something and try it, and don't just organize forums with white guys. <laughs> <laughs> Say I have doctoral students who are pursuing just this sort of question. Doctoral students both in the States and here in, in uh, China. They're both interested in this problem at the middle management level because that's where the action is. I'm sorry, you can talk all you like about design thinking, but until we solve the issue at the middle management level, we will never have a, a significant design culture in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I, all I could say is that I, I believe in starting small, and encourage middle, middle management to find a benefit for their own career paths through executing projects. And I liked very much the idea I mentioned earlier in the morning, they begin with small projects. That's why I, I didn't show the large system design projects. I think we go with small wins, and the middle manager who feels a success in a small project can help to carry that forward. We did this in Australia, by the way. We, uh, instead of working centrally top down, we worked on the periphery of the, the large organization. The organization of about 22,000 people. But we found the middle managers, and we encouraged them through some small policy changes that they were the ones initiating, and they got rewarded. So that's one of the, one of the devices, or some of the devices. I may be the heretic here. I don't have problems with middle managers. Um, because I genuinely think that all levels in the organization have kind of ideas. Somebody asked me once on stage, um, don't you get sick of real people's ideas? And I was like, everybody's a real person, everybody's ideas matter. I think we've been actually quite successful at genuinely, not just paying lip service to the idea of listening, but genuinely listening to people inside of organizations and saying, 
but either top, bottle or mid, top, bottom or middle or wherever. To be honest, half the time I can't even tell and I don't want to know. That's probably the place to start. Um, but you have to get into a post-ego state of actually genuinely believing and hearing people's ideas. And the second that's, my experience has been that the second that a manager, middle, bottom or otherwise, feels genuinely heard, everything changes. So we worked, I worked with P&G Procter & Gamble for five years um, and was actually really excited about this locked layer that everybody talked about in kind of hushed terms, but who had loads of ideas and just never managed to be unlocked. So I wonder if there's a kind of unspoken ego thing in all of this, that we think we have all the great ideas and everybody else's ideas, and everybody needs to go along that journey that we've set for them, as opposed to actually listening to people. I remember, just if I could finish, I remember a workshop when we first did work, work with P&G and they were, okay, everybody's eyebrows were raised, you know, the guy with the tattoos is going to come in and be all creative. And we said, no, 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 you tell us what your ideas, tell us about the ideas you've had forever that you've never, no one's ever heard. And suddenly, it was like, the, the metaphor I used was like it was trapped in people's throats, that they had this stuff and suddenly it was pouring out. And so, to be really honest, I haven't had a huge amount of problems with middle management because we haven't made middle management our enemy. We've actually made middle management our ally. So, I don't know if that's... And yet, and yet P&G has slid back into its older culture. There are pressures to return to the old norms. So, I guess I agree with you that P&G has gone back to old behavior. How do you make it sustainable in the culture? And I guess one other way is just to try to remove middle managers wherever possible. Right? <laughs> If there is no added value, I mean, of course, and I agree with your problem, I think your problem is absolutely real. But one thing when I compare hospitals between Asia and Europe, for example, is always that in Europe we have this big issue between management and medicine or doctors and managers. That problem does not really exist here because we don't have the managers who are not doctors in the first place, right? The same with a home care organization that came over, Bootsrock, originally Dutch, has now also office in Shanghai. They give the power straight into the nurses who are working in the neighborhoods using Uber or Grab kind of technology to actually allow them to manage their care workload. And the things in terms of planning and logistics that were naturally done by middle managers were now done by technology, which allows your neighborhood nurse to go to the patient who needs care in that morning for two hours, but without a necessary structure of people controlling what you're doing. It's a technology that is unleashing what you're doing. Right, so I guess that's another way of trying to simply remove the middle managers and, and, and keep the people energetic. It's good that we're provocative. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I want to direct a question to Paul. I mean, IDEO, you probably have access to the top, but you know, a lot of designers maybe starting out design thing, they're like, you know, either we're talking to middle managers and, and you never see the real decision maker, right? The decision, the decision maker only shows up like 20 minutes and then they're gone. Right. So how, how do you deal with this? Like when, when we don't have access to the top like you, you guys have? Let me be clear, we don't have access to the top all the okay. time. <laughs> I mean, again, I, I, I sound like a broken record. I don't think about top, middle, or bottom. I think about quality of story, quality of idea, quality of empathy, quality of collaboration. All of those things, when you genuinely put them into practice, help the system flow. So a good idea travels, a good story travels, a good insight travels, whether it comes from middle, beginning, you know, middle, bottom, or top of organization. Most CEOs, and I will say most, I don't say all, most CEOs want their talent to be unlocked at some level. And they no, rarely do CEOs say, I want to be the one where everybody's kept down. I mean, that model, I think, is, is, is dissolving everywhere. So the idea that people inside organizations have ideas, I think we often help our clients, whether they're in the middle or the bottom, take those ideas and travel with them. Um, and so, uh, again, I don't think we're, it's, it's, not, it's not as reductive as to say, if you get access to the top, everything works. You have to have good process throughout the whole thing for it to work. I that firmly believe. So, any any government of people here uh, that are facing problems? <laughs> yes, like any anybody working in the government who's trying to implement design thinking, you want to raise some questions to, to the experts here. Come on, Gov. I want to hear Please. From you. <laughs> well, okay. I, I'm not government, but I have a question. I think might be relevant. Um, I think I re I really like this idea of the sort of the four orders of design, and I think you know it's. 
I think it's a very pertinent framework, right? It also sort of re reflects even the journey that a designer goes through in their life, Anyways. step through step. And in fact, you might also map it to an organization, you might also map yes. it to a, to, a, to a country, right? Or a government. Um, I'm wondering whether this is a question for all of you guys is, do you feel that an individual, a company or an organization needs to sort of pass through all orders before they get to the high order? Is no. there is there a learning there, or can we? Is there a leapfrog to the end? I think some people think of those as sort of categories. They're not. They're places where we discover problems. I would say that that four orders framework has been used to develop curricula in schools. A number of universities and colleges have come back and used it. Princeton, for instance, have begun to explore that. So it's pregnant with possibility, and individuals as well as organizations pursue that. But it's not a lockstep set of categories of elevation forward. How do you feel about that? No, I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think uh, you were just saying this too, Paul, right? It's the, the ideas happen anywhere, right? And I think the, uh, I, think, I think it's quite exciting that in, in the design sort of profession, we're now realizing that the power really lies in that higher order, right? Yeah. But the, 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 the process, if you will, I don't want to say that word, but the process or the culture that we, we've kind of uh, celebrated in that, in, in that respect, is just being unlocked at a higher order now, right? So I would personally think that you don't need to progress through all steps, um, but I, I did want to sort of challenge that and see whether there's a different thought. Well, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, on the work we did in Australia, uh, curiously enough, I came back to the States and said, you know, we're working on the design of the Australian taxation system. First question was, oh, you're doing the forms. And I said, no, it's the system. 1001 and 1002 took about five seconds, and they said, oh my Christ, you've got the keys to the kingdom. Yes, when you access at the third and fourth level, you have very significant impact, which is why Paul and I may have our own back and forth in this, but I think we agree in so many areas of this, but that's exactly right. I'm about to disagree for that reason. Right. Um, <laughs> no, no, I think you need both. I mean, yeah. I'm a graphic designer by training, so you know, to me, it still really matters at the end of the day that I can communicate clearly, that's what I was trying to do. Actually, uh, sorry, I know, I know we were all about to roll your eyebrows. A Singapore example. Um, <laughs> we did a lot of work in the Sing in Singapore government helping them sort of streamline the system. Great. Honestly, the thing I'm proudest of with the work we did was we simplified a billion of their forms down from 25 page forms to single page forms, which as a graphic designer were beautifully graphically designed so that a citizen was able to actually know what the F they were supposed to do at any given time inside of the big system, right? So I think you need both. I don't think it's one or the other. I think you need the ability to be able to see the big picture, but also execute the details. Because if you don't execute the details well, the, the, the big picture is not going to make sense. So I actually would sort of build on what you're saying and say it's not one or the other, it's both. Uh, I actually agree with that. And, and well, especially so. in the Asian setting, in my experience, if you want hospital folks right, to, to kind of apply some of it, they need to not just see the example on, let's say, Ministry of Health level, right, or some of the programs that Paul has developed first, but they also need to have the backup. It's, it's often insecurity right, that, that keeps me in the box because my boss can say, do design thinking, right? But if he's not practicing an attitude that if I make a failure, right, I'm just learning from it instead of getting penalized, Right. People will not do it. We started the Speak Up campaign for potentially harming patients. Of course, the first who need to kind of speak up are, are the bosses themselves on a, on a higher level, on a ministry level. Right? And you can see now with some recent cases that you probably have seen in the press after some massive cyber attacks in our Singapore healthcare system as well as recently a leak of HIV data. Right? This is a time where the government is supposed to really show where they stand in this kind of you know, uh, being open about and how, how to change things. Because if it closes down now, pe people will, will not do it on other levels uh, as well. And I think that's, there's still, there's still um, a sensitivity in, in, in that sense. You know, if bosses do not stand up and say, okay, you know, I will go to junkie prison if something goes wrong. Or I give, give kind of the, 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 the lines of that sandbox where you can play it. As long as, of course, you are in that line, you're absolutely free to do. I think people won't feel uh, uh, motivated and safe, safe to, to, to do it. But I think that safety or security aspect, in, in, especially here, is actually very important. Great. Question? Yes. 
So, um, sorry, as um, as specialist of the, this method and this way of, uh, of working uh, and working on wicked problems, uh, do, we, do you have a, a sort of sense of priority of which are the wickedest problems? <laughs> like, like, in which order, if you had, you know, if you don't have to rely on the connection that you make with the client, but you could decide on which problem you could work on because you, you, you think uh, it's what that matters the most, which one would they be? Uh, I, I like your question, but I think I tend to agree with Paul. I'm trying to find some point for us to be different, and we seem to share a lot. I love to work with, with people. I like to find what they find to be difficult. And the wicked problems lie where people have conflicts of values or when they want to do things. Why can't you make the services more effective for people to get things done? Just the simplification of our complexity. I think our systems have gotten so big that we've lost touch of the principles uh, that we used to use to design systems. The wicked problems are found where there are pain points for people. And that's, I think, what Elaine Ann has said, too. That's where I find them. I don't have any scale of which are the wickedest. Um, what, where gives people pain? And where can I make a difference? Or where can my students make a difference? Or my colleagues? Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Okay. Um, any, any other comments? Okay. Um, so the next question that I have is, like, so what are the top three advices for you know, people who are trying to do design thinking in Hong Kong, whether it's government or corporations, like how do, how do they start? Like you know, a low hanging fruit, for example. You have the mic. Go ahead. Oh, oh, oh thank you so much. Beautiful. <laughs> we do have a good um, that, That's a really interesting question. I'm not sure. It depends on the level of preparation, but I believe very much in starting with small things and having successes. Uh, I'm not impressed by huge efforts. Because I think we, as humans, don't do a very good job designing systems. We like to think we do, but in fact, we build in many of the wickednesses that we find later on as consequences. So I'd like to urge finding small issues that we can help improve life on. Whether it's as simple as accessing a, uh, a bus schedule and, and, and finding it in proper design, or if it's working out a system issue and process, wherever you can find an issue and work with people together, that's good. If you can find an employer who'll pay for it, that's good. And student projects are wonderful if they can find sponsors in the government or NGOs and can carry those projects to learn more and more about this. But a lot of this is how we communicate with other people. And learning how to do that is what a designer is about, I think, in many ways. That's why Paul is so good at storytelling. You've got your phone there, right? Yeah. Put it on. I want to talk to Carrie Lamb again. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Carrie. Um, here's, here's, the, here's the simple, here's the thing I've learned after doing this multiple times. Hi, Carrie. Listen to me when I tell you this. This is a big one. Um, the role of government is not to have answers. The role of government is to ask questions. And so that's what you do. You ask questions of your culture, of your society. And you say, what do you need? What should we do? How can we help? What should we do first? That's my biggest learning in working with an evolved government in Dubai, is they know they don't have the answers. And that's actually, to be a post-ego government, to actually assume that you don't know, but that you're, you're not frightened of admitting that, is actually very, very empowering to be around. So I think this idea of sort of start by asking, be genuinely curious, and we've talked a lot today about this idea of genuinely listening, not pretending to listen, which again, I've been around people who think that design thinking is listening, as opposed to actually listening. And then finally, and I think probably most importantly, use the ideas because they're probably great and allow people to see their stuff go out into the world. The story I told at the beginning about being in Parliament in the UK, that to me was the most interesting part, is our stuff, because we, are, because we genuinely listen, goes out into the world. It isn't a token of listening or a gesture of listening, it is an act of listening that is used. So I would say to all of you actually, which is you have to, you have to genuinely want to do this, you have to genuinely listen to this, and you have to really genuinely do stuff with this, then when people see that they're being heard, back to our middle management thing before, everything changes when people feel like this process is authentic. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send it to Edmund and Rachel, and give it to Karen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello, Ms. Lim, on behalf of the Singapore government. No. <laughs> <laughs> You can see I don't say Carrie, but of course I say Miss Lim. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I think uh, I mean, the, the, some of the things have been said. I think starting small, 
Having fields where different layers can associate with, I feel, is also important. Like something like if you have an obesity or a diabetes problem, I don't know about, about Hong Kong, but many societies have, define that as a main area where you will make available grants, where you will unleash uh, expertise on different levels to work on. But I feel you need that kind of layer between more central and, and decentral as a common topic that, that brings people together. Uh, yes, uh, government should not do it, but they should at least show the interest, right? We are happy to have someone from government in this meeting, and then we all feel good about it, right? I think that, that aspect is, is, is very important, right? At least in, in this kind of culture. So you can simply kind of take it away, but hey, it plays a role. So if government plays that role and say, okay, diabetes, right? Well, Singapore, did, we declare the war on diabetes. First time Singapore declared war, right? Not by Minister of Defense, but by Minister of Health. And it really helps a lot. Industrial players, right, from the big companies who are coming in, helping to develop new technologies to, to do your diabetes testing with, with apps, right, all the way to, to scientific research grants. And, but it's like the topic that, that binds together. So I think that, that's one, one area where, where, where multiple layers can, can come together. Can I add a comment on this? Uh, I want to find that one of the problems we face as designers is a split in the culture between a quantitative and a qualitative approach. And I'm not opposed to a quantitative uh, value in what we do, but often the concern for the quantitative takes the place of the qualitative experience that people have. And I think designers are sensitive to what goes beyond the quantity. And I, I just want to mention that generally because we're usually confronting people who are big on the numbers, and that doesn't tell the story that it really concerns us. I just had to say that. Yeah, and one way, I fully agree, one way, I mean, I have a background in both, right? So yeah. one way, and we, we, in especially the doctors, right? They, they believe in numbers, right? most of them. So in terms of um, one way of bridging it, I think is as designers, do not be afraid of numbers, right? Just make sure that you have your right partner with you who can do that part. Right? Instead of saying, oh yeah, no, but we are just looking to the flow and we are just there videotaping your patient process and oh, yeah, get, get the numbers from the statistics department. They can actually strengthen themselves, uh, you know, quite a lot but make sure you bring in the experts on that area instead of playing the, the quantitative expert if you know that you are not right and I think that's another trap with design thinking putting central we should not just think that design thinkers themselves suddenly can do all the jobs right it is still that multidisciplinary team that I would say needs a mathematician probably or a data scientist right and an, and an engineer and a design thinker and probably a psychologist Right? At, at least the, the skill sets that, that are traditionally in those disciplines in order to do the job. Nothing freaks a client out more than a guy who looks like me talking about numbers. <laughs> and <laughs> knowing what I'm talking about. So I actually agree with this. I think that, back to what I said before, the KPI, KPI thing. It's very, very important to have the sort of key performance indicator stuff and to know what that means. It's equally important to have the key people inspired metrics and to understand what those mean. And it's very important for those of us that, that consider ourselves to be creative to understand that that's important. I was in a board meeting last week, actually, for a client in America, and I started quoting, quote, quoting statistics of growth. And literally, nobody could breathe in the room because they just thought I was speaking of, why is this guy saying these things? How can he possibly know this stuff? So I think it's quite interesting. I think, I think numbers are really, really important in all of this. To quantify the things that we consider to be sort of soft metrics. I talk about the, the business value of beauty. A lot, how important it is that something is beautiful, and how the first bite is taken with the eye, and how it's very, very important how something looks and feels, and how that's a measurable thing. And to put that into the conversation is often quite transformative, I think, for our clients as well. Okay. The last part I want to throw in is, uh, you know, it wasn't in our agenda, <laughs> is that to put things into context, like, like design thinking is quite new in Hong Kong, right? It's really just started. Um, and we know that um, sometimes there might be a misunderstanding that. Design thinkings are workshops with post-it notes. <laughs> and even Stanford Design Thinking Boot Camp, you know, it's four days. In Hong Kong, we rarely get four days from executives. Maybe half day, or one day is like maximum. So what, what, do you, what is your advice to a situation like that? Well, it's the same in Singapore, right? So if you want people to just do a two hour, three hour thing to start with, ideally in the evening or during Saturday morning, yeah, that is probably not the common way, but that's the way to get it started. Uh, especially in hospitals, we, we, we all the way, all the time have our meetings either early morning or later in the day or during lunch because that's the only th th time when people don't have clinics. So it's, if as a design thinking community, you want to get into the, the, the real business, 
sorry for the words, but then make sure you, you kind of align at least at the start. Uh, later on, everyone might agree that just two hours is not a thing. We need more time. We need to avail ourselves for reflecting what we are not doing at the moment, right? So we need time for that. But try to get in the first pulse during a during lunch break or whatever to kind of get the message through. And, and for practitioners, we know it's not just a workshop. The workshop is just the start, right? It, it, I mean, I mean, how long how long were your projects for? For example, the healthcare. Um, yeah, I mean, they they start and then you, know, you you need to define whether it's still a project, right? In the end, uh, before it kind of goes to business. But I fully agree, and I think one of the sometimes misconceptions also in Singapore is that you train people via whatever idea or you know, and they are simply a, a design expert after that course, right? But we all know they are not. It's just the start of the journey. That's why I always, when I work with external consultants, I want them to teach our people what some of the principles are, really to do it themselves, right? Which I'm, I'm sure is in line with, with how you're working. But to me, it's a waste if the, the folks cannot do the thing themselves, right? After having those workshops, and we still kind of go to the expert because it's like getting into the hearts of the minds, which means practically allow people to prototype. Right? Have a 3D printer in your office. How many of you have a 3D printer down to your office? Right? Those kind of things I think are very important. Train people how to use it. How many can actually code, do coding themselves? I'm always impressed in Singapore that even in secondary school people learn coding. Uh, in, in 10 years time, all of us should be able to do some coding in order to work probably. Right? So prepare the, the, the current uh, uh, workmanship for, for that by, by, by making it practically available. You want to say yeah, I don't get cranky about this stuff. I, I think it's cool. I think it's all about shared language, right? If somebody wants to talk about the language of design, I don't care if they want to talk about it at 1%, 5%, or 100% skill range. To me, it's all good. If someone's in a boardroom with a post-it note, bring it on. I mean, 20 years ago when I was doing this stuff, and people would talk about design as if we were in some sort of cage in the corner, and give it to the design department, <laughs> that's gone. Now what you know what we do is valid and it sits in boardrooms and it sits with governments. I refuse to get cranky about the fact that somebody would rather be creative than uncreative. However they choose to participate in that, whether it's a one hour or in my case 35 years, those are both fine, valid. It's back to the, don't you get cranky that real people have ideas? No, I get excited that everybody's having ideas. So I don't want to make it a us versus them or a professionals versus amateurs narrative. To me that's very, Kind of that's leaden. I think every anybody who is trying at whatever level to be more creative than they were, bring it on, and that helps all of us. That helps me raise. That makes the pie bigger for everybody rather than just one individual slice. Um, Do you disagree? No, I don't. I I was head of a design school for a long time at Carnegie Mellon University. I left about ten years ago to go to, to a school of management. I went there because I wanted to bring design into the education of managers, because I realized that it's not enough to parachute in to a situation, you may have some engagement that can be terrific, but if we can't embed a confidence in how we do this kind of work at the level of the managers themselves, in whatever area of management, then I think we're not going to see a sustainable commitment to design down the road. So I spend a lot of time with, with people that you wouldn't ordinarily think of as designers, but I do regard them. In fact, I think that management itself is one of the fundamental design disciplines of the 20th century. The object of design was organization and corporation, but, the, but it, in many ways it's very similar. So as I said, I, I want to see the, the design consultant drop in, help for a while, but if it isn't kept up and picked up inside the organization with value and reward, then I think that's a problem for us in the long run. We are still at a dangerous point in the development of design thinking. All of the nice talk here, that's great, but there's a lot of bullshit to watch out for. Be careful about this. Design is a, has been a trendy matter, but we have to watch what's going to come as a backlash. I've already seen signs of it, and that's why those of us who are serious, we're pushing ahead to get past the backlash. We want to see it take a deeper hold. It will if we're careful. Yeah, we're also in Hong Kong, because the word design can mean different things to very different people, right? I mean, like you're from first order to fourth order. And, you know, people might not have the framework. Um, and for years in Hong Kong, you know, when, when I first came back uh, 17 years ago, it's mostly graphic, product, interior, you know, maybe multimedia. So we're, we're using the same word and talking about a different process almost. Yeah, any, any questions? Yeah, at the back. I'd like to ask two related questions. My colleague and I are both 